tonight on Elon Local News. Fraternity in trouble on other campuses? Why the Office of Fraternity Life says Pi Kappa Phi can return to Elon. Election day is tomorrow. What the local candidates plan to do after election day, whether they win or lose, and the races around the country. And still singing together after all these years, Elon's class of 1967 celebrates their 50th anniversary this homecoming. All that and more. Elon Local News starts right now. Live from the Jane and Brian Williams studio at Elon University School of Communications, you're watching Elon Local News. Good evening, and thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Emily Harrison. And I'm Perry Elia Durrani. We begin tonight with an update on Pi Kappa Phi and their return to campus. A familiar fraternity is in trouble in Florida, and it's Elon's chapter causing controversy. Pi Kappa Phi was kicked off Elon's campus in 2015 following a hazing investigation, but members of the group continue to operate using the Pi Kappa Phi name. Elon's interim director of fraternity and sorority life, Jordan King, says that any students involved in the an unofficial fraternity won't be allowed to rush this spring when Pi Cap officially returns to campus. But he is asking the Elon community for help. Students who become aware that anyone may be representing or associating with an unrecognized group on this campus, so specifically Pi Kappa Phi, should report that individual through student conduct. Student conduct will then follow up and, and make sure that the appropriate process is, runs its course for just as they would for any individual who's, uh, who allegedly um, violates an honor code policy. Now, you heard us reference this earlier. Earlier today, Florida State University suspended all Greek organizations following the hazing death of a student pledging that school's chapter of Pi Kappa Phi. King says he is working with Pi Kappa Phi National to prevent incidents of hazing at Elon when the fraternity returns. We'll continue to work with the Pi Kappa Phi National staff and figure that out. We'll continue to work with the Pi Kappa Phi National staff on making sure that we're able to support this chapter so that we, we don't have any incidents like that. Um, I can't speak directly about that incident or how the Pi Kappa Phi International staff is, is, is working to um, resolve anything that's going on there. Pi Kappa Phi will be returning to Elon for Spring Rush, which begins in February 2018. Tomorrow is election day and races will happen across the country. Our Grace Morris has more on the local races here in North Carolina. Tomorrow, residents of Burlington will be heading to the polls to cast their votes for mayor. There are two candidates left after the primary election in October. CeeLo Fawcett, the current mayor pro tem of Burlington, and Ian Baltudis, an Elon graduate and the current mayor. Baltudis won 53% of the primary vote, something that he believes is a good sign for the final election. We're very comfortable going into the general election. We're not resting at all. Uh, we're continuing to push. Fawcett only had 36%, but he doesn't believe that this sets him back. I grew up here. I know just about everything in Burlington, uh, and, and that's a plus on my side. I, I know where people are. I know uh, what we need. Both Fawcett and Baltudas have the same goal, making the community better. If I lose, I'm not going away. I told some council members, uh, I've been active in my community and I'm going to stay active in my community. Uh, again, I love Burlington. It means it's dear to my heart. If this election doesn't go our way, if we don't make it uh, through November 7th, we'll continue to do what we've been doing, which is focusing on organizing our community, focusing on bringing folks together to strengthen Burlington. If you're a resident of Burlington and you want to find your polling place, you can go to alamance-nc.com slash board of elections. Grace Morris, Elon Local News. And we'll be sure to keep you updated on the results of the mayoral election on our website, elonnewsnetwork.com. Uh, two states that many Elon students call home are also holding big elections tomorrow. Jack Norcross has more on how these states' elections will affect the nation. In this off-year election, Virginia and New Jersey residents will be voting for candidates for state-level positions. In Virginia, current Lieutenant Governor Ralph Northam is looking to win the governor's seat. He is running against former advisor to George W. Bush and former chair of the Republican National Committee, Ed Gillespie. Elon freshman Kelly Farmer says she likes the national attention placed on her home state. But it definitely was interesting to me to see that Ed Gillespie is relatively moderate and Donald Trump endorsed him. That was interesting. Um, and it was also really cool that Barack Obama was campaigning for Ralph Northam. New Jersey will also be electing a new governor tomorrow. 
Former U.S. Ambassador to Germany Phil Murphy will try to flip New Jersey blue after eight years of Republican Chris Christie holding the position. Murphy will be running against Republican Lieutenant Governor Kim Guadano. Farmer believes it is important for residents of these states to vote, even if they're not home. Because we still pay taxes there, and even though you may not technically be like residing there, living there, you still you still have the opportunity to have your opinion heard. Back here in Elon, residents will elect two new members to the Board of Aldermen. Davis Montgomery, Emily Sharp, and Jim Chanis are running for the two open seats. And incumbent Mayor Jerry Tolley will be running for re-election unopposed. Jack Norcross, Elon Local News. Polls here at Elon open at 6.30 a.m. and close at 7.30 p.m. tomorrow night. The grandmother-in-law of the gunman behind the Texas church massacre killed his grandmother-in-law during the attack. Devin Kelly killed 26 people and injured more than 20 at a Baptist church on Sunday. Nicole Plant lives in San Antonio, the closest major city to the small town. She says she is shocked an event like this could happen in her home state. This happened in such a rural, small town area, and usually you hear of these things happening in Las Vegas, New York, places that are bigger and more populated. And so I think it's really unexpected and I think it's just going to take a big toll on Texas. But Texas as a state is kind of, you know, proud and I think they're all really going to all rally together and try to move past this in the best way as possible. I'm sorry, it was grandmother-in-law and mistakes alumni coming back over the weekend saw their bricks for the first time, but some weren't happy with the results. And after the break, we'll have your weather live from Strom Plaza. You're watching Elon Local News. John Bellion visited Elon this weekend for the annual homecoming concert. Our Rachel Ellis has more on the reactions across campus. I was disappointed when it started raining, but I knew I was going to go anyway. I was like, pneumonia is worth getting if I get to see John Bellion, so. Usually filled with cars instead of music, the Colonnades parking lot became a John Bellion concert this past weekend. According to senior Victoria Oakley, who has seen Bellion perform live before, the rain did not ruin the concert. Um, experience I've had so far. Elon Student Union Board Concert Director Colton Cataret believes the weather did not influence the success of the concert. Really positive feedback. They said it's one of the most fun shows that they've had or been to since they've been here. Another fan of Bellion's Brianna Coughlin thought the concert should have been moved inside and believes his performance was shortened due to the weather. He played uh, less songs than his normal set list and didn't have an encore and so that kind of was different than what I was anticipating. For Cataret, it is all about the student experience and moving the concert inside would have not accommodated nearly as many people. Rachel Ellis, Elon Local News. Elon was Bellion's second to last stop on his tour. Just like homecoming, the red bricks are another staple of Elon. Alums visiting over the weekend had the chance to see their personalized bricks for the first time, but not all of them were correct. 2017 graduate Jeremy Clements says his brick had a major mistake. Actually, my Greek letter says Delta Psi. I was in Delta Upsilon, um, which I was a little upset about originally, but they were super, super accommodating. Like I literally told them they had like a form ready for me to fill out. Um, they think they were like, it'll be fixed so soon. Like, we're so sorry. Like the Greek letters are sometimes just hard. While the plan for fixing the mistakes is still in the works, Clemens says his brick will keep him connected to Elon for years to come. It's just nice to think like in 20, 30 years, I could come back and show my kids this brick. Like, I went to the school, I have proof. <laughs> the Office of Alumni Engagement was unavailable to comment on the misspelling or the process of fixing it. According to an email sent to alumni last year, the bricks are being paid for on a three-year plan, either $5 a month or $60 a year. Now, we talked about it a little bit in that John Bellion piece, but the weather this weekend was Ugh. just, man, it was like it was misty freezing. and cold. Um, hopefully, uh, Amanda Gibson is outside in Citroen Plaza, and hopefully she'll tell us uh, maybe it's looking better this week. 
Well, we had a beautiful day here on campus, and the fall temperatures are finally starting to set in. But earlier tonight, the skies were looking a little bit gray, which is a good indicator of the week ahead. Tonight, the rain will come with lows dipping into the 50s, and you'll want to keep your rain jacket out all week because it looks like we won't see the sun until Friday. Tomorrow, the rain sticks around with a 60% chance of rain and a high of 54 and lows in the mid 40s. Wednesday, it will be a little bit colder with a high of 47 and a low of 41, but you can still expect to see those showers in the afternoon. Thursday, expect to see much of the same conditions as the rain continues throughout the day. Friday, we should finally see a break in the sky and have the sun poke through with a high around 55, but expect a drop in temperature with a low of 27 degrees. Hopefully, the sun will stick around on Saturday with partly cloudy skies, but the temperatures will stay low around 52 degrees throughout the day and dip close to freezing in the evening. That's all for your forecast. Be sure to grab an umbrella and bundle up this week. Back to y'all at the desk. Thanks, Amanda. And if the chilly weather is making you feel a little festive, you might have already started to decorate your room. Liam Collins has more on how to avoid residence life fines this holiday season. It's officially November, and while Christmas is still over a month away, some students are already getting into the holiday spirit. It's a nice source of light at night when I don't want to have the main overhead light on. Elon sophomore Stephanie Brendel is talking about her battery-powered string lights, a room decoration specifically outlined on the Residence Life website as an illegal dorm room item. I actually left them up for room checks and they were completely fine. No one said anything about it, so I've just left them. But um, I know people who have been asked to take them down, and then they do, and then after the room checks are done, they put them back up. Elon sophomore Quinn Riley is an RA on the second floor of Moffat Hall in the Colonnades neighborhood. He says the decorative detail is a fire hazard. When they're taped to a wall, um, sometimes at the end of the year, if the lights are on a lot, um, you'll have like these little like burn marks on the wall themselves, and then they have to go through and repaint them. But for Brendel, her lights are used for more than simply a decorative feature. My room is right facing like the outside, so if I have the light on, everyone can kind of see into my room. So having like the smaller source of light where I can still see and get around my room without having other people be able to see in it is really nice. According to Riley, violations are reported by RAs, but the $25 fines are issued by neighborhood offices. If the violation is gone by the time of a second visit by the RA, the violation can be updated, but the fine is still up to the discretion of residents' life. Liam Collins, Elon Local News. Senior Associate Director of Residence Life, Marquita Barker, says Residence Life has not kept a record of room violations so far this semester. Residence Life will do health and safety inspections and charge for violations over Thanksgiving break. For more information on room violations and what you can and cannot have in, on your on-campus housing, go to elon.edu. Registration for winter and spring semester classes begin this week. Courtney Weiner has everything you need to prepare. Registration can be a stressful time for students. Here are some tips to make your registration process go a little smoother. Make sure to find out your registration time. Find your registration time by going to the schedule menu on OnTrack. You can find your time based on credits if you're an upperclassman and by last name if you're a freshman. Set a reminder to help you remember when you need to register. Have a couple of backup schedules ready just in case. Use your shopping cart on OnTrack to organize the classes that you need. This saves you time on registration day. Registration is all about preparation, so make sure you are ready when your registration time comes. Courtney Weiner, Yvonne, Local News. To find out when you can start registering for your classes, go to the registrar's website at elon.edu forward slash registrar. If you've taken a look at the schedule for winter term, you might have noticed the first three days of classes are four hours long instead of three. On January, 20, January 3rd, 4th, and 5th, classes will be from 8 a.m. to noon and from 1 p.m. to 5 instead of the usual 8 to 11 and 1 to 4. University Registrar Rodney Parks says this has to do with the way the calendar falls this year. Parks says there needs to be 14 class days, but if the classes don't start until January 3rd and spring semester starts on January 29th, there will only be 13 class days. The extra hour for the first three days is supposed to make up for that missed day. One local business is turning a problem into a positive. And a big weekend on the gridiron and on the court. I'll have all you need to hear in Phoenix Sports coming up. You're watching Elon Local News.
If you've been through downtown Elon, you might have noticed a wooden panel in one of the windows at Pandora's Pies. According to staff at Pandora's, the front window spontaneously burst last week. The restaurant is making the best of the situation by inviting the community to write memories and positive messages on the panel until the window is replaced. Elon Sr. and Pandora's worker Story Stadler says the concept has been well received by the community. We decided to make something negative into something positive, and we filled it with a billboard until we're going to have it fixed. We put pins on it, and we're allowing people to sign it. I think it's a good way to uh, show a sense of community. Until then, the management is working on replacing the window within the next coming weeks. Some Elon students are starting an initiative to encourage women of color to share stories about their own college experiences. Our Samantha Casamento has more. This is so necessary, it's so needed, at, especially at this time um, where I feel like a lot of brown college girls um, could be, you know, coming into college our first gens um, and don't really have anyone to kind of connect with or to see like, oh my gosh, someone else feels the same way as I do. Brown College Girls is a new independent initiative on Elon's campus. It is run by four Elon students hoping to create a space for women of color to explore their identities. Founder Lexi Roberts says it will educate, inspire, and empower students. Right now it's a social media platform to try and encourage girls to share their content, share their story that's specific to their college experience. Team member Ariane Payne has joined the initiative to give other students like her a place to belong. It's a really cool opportunity to not only grow your writing skills or your um, marketing skills or XYZ, but also to just grow as a person. Brown College Girls has an Instagram account of the same name where they post motivational content. We're sharing, you know, daily inspiration. We have spotlights and highlights of people who, you know, we think are really great positive figures for Brown College Girls. We also have our peers. Robert says anyone can benefit from working on this initiative. I think everybody has something to learn because it's a place where we're sharing experiences, where we're sharing narratives, and there's always something to be learned from there. And so we're really trying to make it this inclusive space where everyone has an opportunity to take something from it. Samantha Casamento, Elon Local News. Brown College Girls meets once a month, and anyone interested in joining their team can get more information by emailing browncollegegirls at gmail.com. It's been an exciting week in Elon Athletics. We have yes. Miles Garrett live in the studio to give you the details. Thanks, guys. Announced today, the Phoenix holds on to its number seven ranking for a second week in a row in the football championship subdivision after what almost became a disaster of Super Bowl-like proportions for Kurt Signetti's squad. The Elon football team was able to withstand a 17-point comeback from Towson this Saturday in a 33-30 double overtime win. Davis Cheek had another great game with 271 yards passing and a spectacular touchdown throw to Trey Marsh in the corner of the end zone. But it was freshman Owen Johnson who came in clutch for the Phoenix again. Kicker had three field goals, including the game winner in the second overtime. Johnson now leads the CAA in field goals, and his effort on Saturday was enough to earn him the Conference Special Teams Player of the Week. Elon now sits at 8-1 and, and undefeated in conference play, which makes next week's game against New Hampshire vital for the team's potential playoff position. This Elon team still has a lot to prove. Like, I mean, like Coach said, we still have some opportunities out there where we can, we can play better. It's always a great thing. You want to be able to play the title, but we can't look past New Hampshire because it's a, great, it's a really good football team. The Elon women's volleyball team defeated Colonial Athletic Association rival Northeastern three sets to zero on Sunday afternoon. <laughs> Seniors Sydney Busa and Michelle Klein of ENN were honored senior night before the game. Just overall, we played smart like we knew when we could go for it, knew when we had to be a little bit more reserved. So I think that, you know, coupled with everything else, really, you know, brought us out on top. The women take on CAA foe College of Charleston this Friday. Also in Alumni Gym on Sunday, the women's basketball team is back and played their first exhibition game, defeating Anderson University 102-47. In the offseason, players have been hitting the weight room to get stronger for this upcoming season. Well, weights <laughs> have been getting me up there. I stayed over the summer with Coach Ty, and he's helped me, like, get stronger so that way I can take these big girls down. The women faced Winthrop in Alumni Gym on Friday in their first official game, while the men take on Duke in Durham. That's all for sports. Back to you, Perry and Emily.
Thanks, Miles. Elon's class of 1967 returned home to this campus this weekend and saw 50 years of changes. You're watching Elon Local News. When the class of 1967 graduated from Elon, the school was still a college, the mascot was a fighting Christian, and Dr. J. Earl Danley was the president. Our Brooke Wivag sat down with the class of 1967 to find out what has changed and what never will. I should have studied more instead of playing around so much. <laughs> For 1967 Elon alumna Sandy Bergman Inman, the Elon she went to has been transformed. I haven't been here in 40 years, so I was just amazed. I mean, I remember the four walls and everything was in there except for the, uh, the church, you know, on the other side and the, and the gymnasium. So it was just, I mean, it's so beautiful. It's just gorgeous. But some things never change. Whiskey, whiskey, Nancy, whiskey. Inman's classmates Wayne Seymour and Phil Shaw hadn't performed together since 1965. But at their 50th homecoming reunion, they picked up right where they left off. It was great fun to sing with him because I found that his voice has changed less. And mine, I used to be quite higher, and mine's way down here now. So I had to adapt, but I was surprised that, that we, could, we could still do it. Their time as a folk duet created memories that have lasted a lifetime, including one performance in West Hall. Uh, I remember it because my wife was sitting in the corner and I didn't notice her, but she turned to the house mother and says, I'm going to marry him, but he doesn't know it yet. And she did. Like Seymour, Inman says at Elon, you find your people. It was such a family. You know, uh, and every the, the ties that you make are so close, the people are so genuine. So while the university might not look the same, it will always be home. Berkeley Bag, Elon Local News. University President Leo Lambert stopped by the 50th reunion tent at Saturday's tailgate, where many of the alumni had the chance to beat him for the first time. Can you believe that? I cannot. <laughs> well, that's all the news we have for you tonight. Thanks for joining us. For all the news you need to know, check us out at elonnews.com. And be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, Instagram, 